This morning, Mr. Bruce Rivers had talked a bit in his main meaning of the day message on, uh, touched on war uh, as one of the aspects or one of the themes that we do talk about during uh, Feast of Trumpets. At that same, on that same thought, global peace is something the world has no means and no understanding of how to achieve on a large scale, but it is also one of the themes of this day, global peace. Because wars have pockmarked man's history since the very beginning. Can you think of an age or a culture, if you are a history buff, I'm not necessarily a history buff, but if you could think of an area of the world throughout human history that has never had war for an extended period of time, come tell me about it because there are some estimates that in human history, when there wasn't any armed conflict that is recorded, it might be a 200 year period somewhere in the past and some say even as short as 35 years that human beings haven't been involved in some kind of armed conflict. So I don't really think there's an expert answer to that. It's probably really zero years when you think about where wars originate from, the human heart, right? The human heart. It's because of pride and hatred and covetousness and greed that stir people and hatred, add that as well, stir people and their religious, twisted religious, radical jihad is something that's fairly new on the world scene. Uh, people fighting wars for their religious beliefs as well. And so it's very sad. Our nation within our borders has actually enjoyed a period of time, an extraordinary period of time between the bombing at Pearl Harbor in 1941 when most Americans didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was until the news flash came out over the radio in those days that the naval installation in Hawaii had been bombed by the Japanese up until 20 years ago, this coming Wednesday. 20 years ago will be the 9-11 um, uh, 2000, I'm sorry, that, is that correct? Today's the 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, four days from now. The 9-11 attacks on the Twin Towers in New York and also the Pentagon building. That was a long stretch actually, but it will be 20 years marking that date in just a few days. Recently, some of you have heard this quote. It's in classic Latin. Mr. Joel Meeker used it in uh, the in accord that was just uh, little excerpts were played for us. He used it at the International Ministerial Conference. He says, Si vis pacem parabellum. It's Latin for simple quote. It means if you want peace, prepare for war. And that's been the mentality of nations. Between the end of World War I in 1918, the so called War to End All Wars, and 1939, when Germany was rearming and trying to um, get prepared to take back land that was stripped away from them, and the humiliation that they saw being defeated in World War I, how many years was that? 21 years. 21 years between the end of World War I and the start of World War II. It wasn't very long. And then since 1945, there have been generally at least a dozen regional wars going on at any given time across the globe. Any given time, at least a dozen. There's a global monitoring website called International Crisis Group. I went on this site yesterday. There was an article written December 30th, this, uh, just before the end of 2020. This is past year. And it was predictions. The title of this article was 10 Conflicts to Watch in 2021. The author starts by saying this, the COVID-19 pandemic has precipitated a global economic crisis without precedent since World War II, with an additional 150 million people being driven below the poverty line, the extreme poverty line. Although income levels do not directly correlate with conflict, violence is more likely during periods of economic stress and volatility. This author then 
uh, goes in what he estimated or predicted were the top 10 areas of conflict in the world. And this was, again, December of last year. Number one, he puts down Afghanistan. Sure enough, Afghanistan. He predicted that despite small uh, but important advances in peace talks, a lot could go wrong with Afghanistan in 2021. And he was right. Next after that, we have yet to see, but he puts Ethiopia in Africa, and then a region in Northern Africa called the Sahel region. After that, Yemen, then Venezuela in South America, Somalia, Libya, and he goes down the list of where the hot spots could break into all kinds of civil war, fighting, murder, death, mayhem. Sad, it's very sad. James, the apostle, speaks to the root causes when he says in James 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from the desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. Now, humanity hasn't changed. The human heart is still the human heart. And that was James 4, verse 1. Again, pride, hatred, covetousness, and greed in the hearts of men. It brings people to war. It's very sad. Albert Einstein said, problems are never solved at the same level of awareness that created them. When we see the world plunge into terrible global war and conflict, or even regional war and conflict, human beings know intellectually how to prevent that, but the human heart tells different, doesn't it? It tells differently. Ben Franklin says, and I'll paraphrase, with great concern, we see how much effort it takes to remedy a problem when the solution has been known for a long time. The solution is peace on God's terms. The world doesn't seek that. Please turn to Joel 3 and verse 9 with me. Joel 3 and verse 9. The world does not seek God's peace at this time. And we're going to see that the world will get its fill of war before Christ establishes his kingdom here. But really, my message, I haven't even gotten to my my uh, SPS, my specific purpose statement of my message, but it's very positive, actually. Joel 3 and verse 9, it's because mankind wants war, that God is going to give man a period of war to fill up to, till his cup overflows, until it's running out of his nostrils, so to speak, till it's pouring out of his veins, so to speak. And so... Joel here is describing the very last war that will take place for a thousand years. A thousand years of peace will ensue. Joel 3 verse 9, proclaim this among the nations, prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble, come, all you nations, gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, Lord. Verse 12, God says right where that's going to be. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Verse 13, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down. For the winepress is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. God is going to allow human beings to have their fill of war until they see how absolutely devastating it's going to be. Leading up to that last great assembly when all the nations, it says in the Bible, will bring their armies together, they're all invited, and they're going to be brought into a whirlwind of the madness of war Satan will stir the nations to fight Jesus Christ as he returns, as we've heard about that today, and when all his mighty host of angels come with him from heaven. By divine intervention, Jesus Christ will directly engage in battle and suddenly put an end to this war. Again, never again for another thousand year period. 
Joel 3 verse 14 continues, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. What does that mean? It describes a place where a quick and sharp judgment is going to take place. I won't turn, but Psalm 2 and verse 1 is a similar prophecy of the same event. A very short verse. Psalm 2 verse 1 just says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Referring again to fighting Jesus Christ and the angelic host when they return in the heavens from the, he from the, from the clouds. Joel 3 verse 15 continues. This is a parallel with Revelation 6 and Matthew 24 talking about the signs in the heavens, the terrifying signs uh, on heaven and earth. Verse 15, the sun and moon will grow dark. The stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord will also roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth shall shake. And then verse 16, but the Lord will be a shelter to his people. Very important to see that when so many prophecies of doom and gloom show up in the Bible, God points his attention to the faithful and he shares what he has in store to protect his people. It says, verse 15, second half, but the Lord shall be a shelter for his people and a strength of the children of Israel. So God never leaves his faithful ones without hope. While the nations get pulled into a, this vortex of frightening events, terror, anxiety, fear of the unknown, and great people are going, great numbers of people will be caught up in upheaval all around the earth, Jesus Christ will continue to watch over his church. He does not want us to lose heart. He doesn't want us to be afraid. When we see more and more evil things take place around us, in the nations around us, or even in our own country, as we patiently wait for Christ's appearing. Three areas now I'd like to, uh, with my remaining time to emphasize in this message are, there will be a message of hope and warning for the nations. Jesus Christ will care for his flock and provide for its needs, even through difficult times. And thirdly, having endured what follows will be the revealing of the sons of God. We'll look at three of those, all three of those points. My title today is, Be Not Afraid. Simply, Be Not Afraid. We understand that the generation we're living in is very likely the one that Jesus Christ said, this generation shall not pass till all these things take place. He talks about in the Olivet Prophecy. It is also parallel with a time when human beings can annihilate all life on the planet. There are several key things that had to fall in place before we could say that this was uh, all annihilation of human life was even possible on this earth, not until nuclear, um, uh, nuclear bombs were created that could destroy all life. And there's other chemical means of, and biological means of warfare as well, but things that could annihilate all humanity, this wasn't possible until about 1950, to be more accurate, about 1950. Now this day, presents sobriety and intensity for us, but it also brings us anticipation and joy in the message, joy in the message. We have, I believe, and I put this in my notes and thought about it several times, just in recent decades, those of us in the church that have been students of prophecy have watched certain things unfold, watch certain prophecies slowly unfold that allow us to see the picture more clearly ahead of us. And I think over the next few years that will even become more so. Some, some prophecies that we really are trying to um, get a real handle on, I think with time they become more and more clear. And they will. 
that maybe God designed it that way, that we would not, uh, as, as his people, understand things until it was necessary to know them. But the world around us does not know that it's racing toward the climactic self-destruction. It does not know this. And God promises to intervene and stop humans from destroying utterly every human life on the planet just in the nick of time. God promises to do this. This day, again, is not for dwelling on all the evil and terrible things that are coming about on an unsuspecting earth without at the same time giving a message of hope and of comfort and of encouragement and of joy. So my first point today of emphasis on this message, this feast day of rejoicing, of which we're here for, there must continue to be a message that goes out to the world, a message of hope. Yes, a message of warning too, but a message of hope as the world goes from crisis to crisis. I won't turn, but Daniel 12, verse 10. Daniel 12, verse 10 is a short passage. In a vision, Jesus Christ, the revelator, tells Daniel that the meaning of the book was to be sealed from understanding until this age we live in. There's another marker right there that Jesus Christ said, go your way, Daniel, and this won't be made clear until the end of the age, at the time of the end. Verse 10, many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to do wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. God will continue to open up our minds to understand things when the rest of the world is tragically closed off until they make the initiative to learn God's ways. So what is this understanding? Well, understanding the true fear and reverence of God is one, trust in his promises, understand the only source of biblical truth being the Holy Bible, those kinds of things. Also understanding the reasoning behind all the calamities, all the destruction, terrible things happening in nature and in human, human endeavors. The time of Jacob's trouble, the mark of the beast, the signs in the heaven, even the event of Christ's return. People are going to be terrified, it says in the Bible, because they don't understand. Now, God says, and he promised, he would do none of these things except that he first would tell his servants the prophets. That's in Amos 3, verse 7. So again, we're very blessed to have the knowledge we have. God says the wise will listen to his words. The wise will listen to his words. Please do turn to Amos 8 and verse 11 with me. Amos, that's just before Joel, I believe, in the minor. Amos Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. I'm sorry, it's after Joel. Joel and Amos, apologize. Joel and Amos, Amos 8, verse 11 and 12. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God. I will f- send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor of a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Who's they? Well, probably the majority of humankind that's at least trying to understand and put the the puzzle together, why so much calamity, so much sorrow, so much suffering is happening in the earth. We have seen in God's church over a period of decades that the United States has been the main financial engine for the preaching of the gospel. Part of this could be a shutting down of the ability to preach. There could come a day when it's, uh, people will be jailed for preaching the truth even in democratic countries. We've seen some signs of this. There are many people out there that hate Christianity, hate God, who want the government to control everything in people's lives, even in our society. It's very sad, but that's just the way things are trending. So that's one area that could add to the famine of the word. In the nations of Jacob could also, though, keep this in mind, 
just out of sheer apathy, out of distractions, out of cares of this world, out of spiritual deception and confusion, also face a famine of the word. When fewer and fewer people take note and want to read the Bible and want to learn what God says, they're, they're creating their own famine of the word in that sense. It's very sad, but this is the way, the course that God has shown us. When the time is right though, God will send even stronger testimony. Again, when he says the time is right, who would that be? Well, of course, the two witnesses coming on a global scene, not just one country or another, on a global scale, and hopefully get the attention of all nations, at least some, who will make the changes needed in their lives before destruction comes. Because we're told, as it was in the days of Noah, there will be massive ignorance and lack of interest. The days of Noah, people went about their normal routines and daily uh, activities as if nothing were going to happen, and the signs of warning were available. The signs were there. You and I are instructed that such fears are not to grip you and me. We're to be not afraid. We will have to endure patiently, knowing all these events are all moving towards one glorious event, and of course that is Christ's coming and the setting up of his kingdom. We know they move in that direction. Meantime, meantime, I'm sorry, as doors are still open to preach the gospel, that's what God has us to do. As long as doors are still open to continue to publish God's truth, that's our mission. That's our calling as a church. Now, multiple times in the scriptures, Jesus Christ would end a parable with, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Something you've heard in some of the uh, parables in the New Testament. God is going to impart understanding to the faithful, again, as Daniel said, those who keep God's commandments, the wise. Please turn to Matthew 13, verse 41. Matthew 13, verse 41. Matthew 13, verse 41, and as a whole today, I'm only turning to 10 scripture passages. Matthew 13, verse 41. Here's just an example of what I'm talking about here. It's depicting the conclusion of the great white throne judgment in this passage when all judgment of humanity and of Satan and his demons is finished. And when we read this, you and I are here today because God has blessed us with ears to hear and a heart that can be touched by his word and stirred by his Holy Spirit. It's God's will for all of us to understand what is going to happen in the years ahead of us. So none of us is caught unawares. So here we read together, verse 41. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. There will be a separation of the wheat from the chaff Many parables, many analogies Jesus Christ gives of the sorting and the sifting, each person in his proper order, his or her proper order of judgment. But it does point towards the great white throne judgment period in, some, uh, in the vast majority of people. Now, in this time period we're living in, uh, Mr. Clyde Kylo illustrated something in, this was also a little excerpt that we might have seen in the In Accord last week. We saw this at the International Conference of Elders. Mr. Clyde Kylo is addressing the eldership and he says, could there be a large number of people that are spiritually asleep that will waken when the conditions are right? And he says, look at the seeds in the analogy of the lodgepole pines, the sequoias, the eucalyptus trees, and perhaps others. Their seeds will not germinate until the intense heat of a forest fire 
does something to them, wakes them up, pops them open. I'm not sure what it is, but scientists that study by botany, they would know. But something about certain seeds of certain trees will not open and germinate until the heat of a forest fire goes through the areas where they're resting in the ground. So that's just an analogy. And so think about for a moment, 50, 60, 70 years now of this end time work of God, many seeds being planted in people that are still alive today, still alive, and still of their right consciousness and cognitive ability. These seeds are spiritual seeds that could wake up when the conditions are quote unquote hot enough. This was Clyde Kylo's illustration. The suggestion was brought up for years now, and I've talked about it many times, that many seeds have been planted. It's up to God in his timing when some people will wake up to things they'd heard 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And then just to see if some people that you and I know have had minimal contact with God's truth or even a lot of an understanding of God's truth that could be in a spiritual sleep. God will know, and God is the one who can certainly stir up uh, people's minds and hearts. We're reminded that the work that God has laid out for his church is to preach the gospel, put the seeds out there, that God will do the calling. God will do the calling. Much work has already been done in the last 50, 60, 70 years in God's church. There are many illustrations in the Bible about how the parched deserts will, in the millennium, turn into beautiful verdant fields and roses and blossoms and trees growing. I grew up in Southern California and some years of my childhood I'd spend in the hot desert areas east of Los Angeles and it was desert. And I remember uh, loving to walk along riverbeds and. Uh, and uh, play with cactus and uh, play with red ants and uh, go chase um, uh, wasp nests and see if they could catch me if I poke them out. You know, just silly things that kids, boys do. Silly things that boys do. Well, it was a very dry area for a few years of my life and it was uh, just dusty and sandy. And when the rains came in the spring, which was a very short period of time, Riverside, California, Everything would bloom into green and grass, and it wouldn't last long, but it was so green for a few short weeks of rain. Then it would go back to the desert again, but it just shows how fast a brown, parched landscape can come alive, can come alive again. Is God able to stir up spiritual seeds that have been planted long ago? Well, I believe they are. He is. Uh, there is a passage in Isaiah 55, verse 10. Let me read it to you. This was also something that Mr. Clyde Kylo mentioned. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. It says that his word, when it goes out, will not return to him unfruitful and unproductive. It says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not turn, return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Verse 11 says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. God can determine when to wake up and stir people, spiritual seeds that are asleep. And that's comforting to know that. It's very comforting to know that. We also know that at the start of the millennium, God's Holy Spirit will be poured out like water, just uh, gushing uh, like a fountain. And many illustrations in the Bible about how God's Holy Spirit will, will be so abundantly available where it's not right now. It's very, uh, 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 very few people are being called in this age. But um, when this happens, there will be a great harvest through that thousand year period and of course the great white throne judgment beyond. Now interesting cycles have happened even in this last 40, 50, 60 years that many in this room are uh, a part of in God's work. I re can remember hearing that it, when it was difficult times 
in the early years, Herbert W. Armstrong was on the air with the Radio Church of God, and they didn't know where the next week's income was going to be. They paid the seven dollars to go on the air, or something a uh, very low price like that in our in our estimation, to buy airtime to put on the next program of a uh, World Tomorrow program, and so. This was something that they, it was just always constantly a, a matter of praying and asking for God to open doors. And when they were, there were times of prosperity in the church when there was booming growth, but it didn't always correlate with income. Didn't always correlate with income. For many years, the church, we often did equate success in terms of numbers of people that God was calling into the church. But during lean times, there were also the periods of purifying and sifting God's people. And there were also times when finances were very lean, that more and more people would call or write in or, or ask for visits from the ministry and make contacts. Uh, my former boss in Pasadena on the Ambassador College campus would reminisce with me. He would say at times in the mid 60s, paychecks, might be missed for the employees of the college. Uh, and sometimes they would go a skip a week and be a week late at times. It wasn't the income to pay the payroll of all the employees. And it was sometimes during those periods that the church would go through the testing, but also it would grow. It would grow in those times as well. So it's a pretty fascinating how God takes his church through cycles and unpredictable patterns at times. We just read a moment ago in Daniel 12, verse 10, many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. That's very comforting. It's very comforting. Through all the crises and tribulation yet to come upon the earth, we're told, the faithful are told, be not afraid, be not afraid. If you are in the area of Isaiah still, Isaiah 58, verse 1. Isaiah 58, verse 1. In Isaiah's day, the prophet was told to warn his countrymen. Isaiah said, with God's message, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek my face, or they seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness, it was all a facade. You see, it was just all a surface uh, veneer of going through motions and ceremony. But God knew their hearts. They were not right with him. As a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the oracles of their God, but he's saying they are uh, they're falling deeper and deeper into the sins. And so the passage goes on to describe the crimes, the sins, the foolishness of a nation that strayed from God. The warning aspect of the gospel message truly is a message of salvation. We talk about one of the themes of today, it's war, it's also a warning to the world, a message of hope and a message of warning, but even the message of hope truly is a message of salvation. In preaching the, a message of warning, we do have to be wise in not scaring people into some false form of obedience to try to save themselves physically. You remember probably some of you in the 60s and 70s, people would think back and say, well, I came into the church because I was afraid of all the terrible things that were going to happen and are probably going to happen by 1973 and prophecy and things like that. And Floods of people probably came. I have to admit, in 1973, I wasn't being called at the time, but by 1974, prophecy was the big hook for me that got my attention. It was prophecy. And then I started sending off for booklets, and I finally called for a minister to come visit me, and then I got to start attending church, which was wonderful. That was 1974. But anyway, so what I'm saying is, we don't want to convey something that a false obedience or into some insincere repentance for the wrong reasons. At the same time though, 
We must get people to recognize that unless there is repentance and turning from sin, and unless they realize that Jesus Christ is the only door to salvation, what happens to people? They inevitably get lulled right back into a spiritual slumber again, hopefully to be woken up at some point, but hopefully also before it's too late. So point one was that God's church must not shrink back from preaching a gospel message of warning and hope in the face of steadily increasing ridicule, opposition to Christianity in general, which we're seeing a little more and a little more every year in this country, and um, not be ashamed of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So point number one, we're not to shrink back from taking part as God has given us part in this work. Point number two out of three, the emphasis of this feast day of rejoicing is that Jesus Christ will care for his flock. No matter what is going on around us in the world, God will care for his flock. Please turn to Luke 12, verse 29. Luke 12, verse 29. Here Jesus Christ tells us in terms of not fearing how we are going to have our physical needs met from day to day. Verse 29, and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. I'll put that in a different terms. We're not to make that our highest priority. Yes, we have to feed our families. Yes, we have to work to have the money to pay for a roof over our heads and the insurance and the car insurance and the car payment and the gasoline and the food, everything else. Yes, we have to do that. But we're not to have an anxious mind. We're not to have that as our highest priority in life. Verse 30, for all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Verse 32, do not fear little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We're to be not afraid. This is what Jesus Christ is saying. It's saying, in effect, we don't have to dwell in fear about the uncertainty of the times we're living in or any perilous time yet ahead. As long as you hear my voice, Jesus Christ is saying, and heed my words and continue to walk circumspect because the days are evil and getting more evil. Watch around us, watch our back, watch from side to side, be discerning, be wise, and also to prepare ourselves as the bride of Christ. So I borrowed my title today, Be Not Afraid. Most of you uh, uh, thought of it or it, it connected with you Im immediately, probably from one of the hymns in our hymnal, page 104, Be Not Afraid, My People. It was composed by Sonia King. I was in college with her in Pasadena. I was inspired by a number of different passages in the Bible. Let me read just a couple of verses from the song. Verse one reads, be not afraid, be not afraid, my people. I am your God who watches over you. Sons, be not afraid of man, be you not afraid. Verse two partially reads, what can man do to those who fear my name? I am the Lord protecting you from danger. Though the mountains quake and roar, be ye not afraid. And in verse three ends with, lift your heads, redemption's near, be you not afraid. Now that last sentence was inspired by Luke 21, verse 28. If you're still in Luke, let's move over to chapter 21 and verse 28 and see where that phrase comes from. Luke 21, verse 25, we'll start there, and we'll see that there's a stark contrast, a wide contrast to how God's people are going to respond when they see the signs of the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven to the rest of the world who sees the very same thing that you and I are seeing. A huge contrast between 
how they respond to the same exact thing. Verse 25, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and um, perplexity at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. Now, the imagery, uh, we, we, we don't know exactly what that means other than strange forces of nature that God is going to cause turbulence and, and cause terror in using the elements of nature, perhaps. Verse 26, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Verse 28, this is talking to the faithful. Now when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. You see the positive emphasis on that? Look up because you know your redemption is near. Can we read into that the contrast? We wait, we hope, we look for God's kingdom to come and we're to be not afraid. Verse 29, then Jesus Christ speaks to them a parable. Look at the fig tree, he says, and all the trees. When they're already budding, you see and you know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. I referred to this verse just at the start. This generation, we had, uh, you know, well, I should say, I was always struggling with what generation? The people that were listening at that time or the people in the latter days watching this or listening to this verse? We've come to see clearly that Jesus Christ is talking about a time when these things could take place. I mentioned already how uh, the annihilation of all human life on the planet has only been uh, something that we could see since about 1950 when the Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, and the United States were starting their, their arms race to make the largest nuclear weapons on Earth. And of course the hydrogen bombs of today are thousands of times more powerful than the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Thousands of times more powerful. So anyway, we've come to see that this quote-unquote generation is more than likely a human lifetime. Let's say something like 75 to 100 years even, if you really stretch it out. There are a few people alive that are 100 years old. We have one man in our congregation who's 96. He stands straight, he's sharp. Mind, he just got his driver's license recently in Michigan. He, um, he's not with us this afternoon. His, he went home with his family, but we know who we're talking about. Anyway, so there are a few people that are still alive, a hundred plus. But it's a fluid word in the Bible. A generation could mean 30 years or 40 years, a human lifetime. Maybe it could even be a hundred years. So in any case, I think we could all agree that we're looking at Jesus Christ's words talking about a generation that is in the last days. I believe we could see that. Now, we thank God that he has provided a way to protect us if we're watching and if we are asking and praying to be accounted worthy to escape these things which shall come up to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21, verse 36. A great memory verse, great memory verse. So let's please now turn to Revelation 3 and verse 10. Revelation 3 verse 10, we're on this topic of God protecting his people. In times when around us things look horrible or they might look like there's no hope, how could he possibly, God could, uh, how could possibly God protect his people? We need to know that he will and he can. Revelation 3 verses 10 through 12. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to that which you have that no one may take your crown. 
Now that indicates a time of testing. It will require perseverance. It will require the patience of the saints. And when Jesus Christ says he's coming quickly, there is going to be a swift uh, movement or motion when the time is right, when God the Father sends his son back. I, I can only picture in my mind the Father saying, because the son doesn't know the day or the hour. None of the angels do. No one on earth knows the day or the hour. But the Father does. And if he says, son, it's time, you can know that it is going to be sudden. It has, we have to see that that is something sudden when the time is right. Not letting anyone take our crown, part of this, does not mean letting fear and anxiety affect us, which will come upon the earth, as we've seen. We always stand a risk in God's church of if we stray too far from a close relationship with God, that we might lose hope, that we might be discouraged, that we might get distracted, that we might wander into Satan's territory. And so we're constantly adjured and encouraged to keep building that relationship with God. We're at verse 12, we're in Revelation verse 12, uh, 3 verse 12, he who overcomes, here's the promise aspect, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and I will write on him my new name. It's wonderful, wonderful and comforting. Psalm 91 verse one, another passage of tremendous comfort when things around us might look dismal at some point in time. Um, this was, it's become a favorite passage of mine showing God's remarkable ability and desire to guard his people in a time of need and despair when rational minds think there's no way out of this, there's no way that God could offer protection, but he does. Psalm 91 verses one through eight. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord eternal, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely, he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Think of all the scenarios of calamity, of disaster, of crisis, of suffering. And yet God knows in his vast wisdom if he needs to take any of his saints and put them into a temporary sleep until a later time. He knows the timing. But as a, as a rule, this is a very comforting psalm for us. Verse eight, a thousand may fall at our side. 10,000 may fall at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Very comforting, very comforting passage indeed. I won't turn, but here are two short reference verses that give us hope in the message of this day. One is in Titus 2, verse 11. Paul is encouraging Titus in this letter. He says, in Titus 2, verse 11 through 13. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're to look for it. We're to ask thy kingdom come in our prayers. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, another reference. 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, we're to greatly look forward to Christ's return. 
Paul said about himself, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, a day of his resurrection. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. All that love and anticipate in hope in the appearing of Jesus Christ. Let's turn, please, just, oh, we only have maybe three more passages to turn to, but 2 Peter 3 and verse 11, 2 Peter 3 and verse 11. This verse is not in conflict with what Amos said. We didn't turn to a passage in Amos, what Amos warned Israel, don't desire the day of the Lord. You have no idea what you're asking for because it is a day of destruction. It's a day of the terrible vengeance of God. So. Here is not a conflict with that, but here's what Peter said, 2 Peter 3, verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, he's talking about the reformation of the surface of the earth here, the best we understand. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, anticipating, hoping for it, asking God, bring your kingdom. Because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, the elements will melt with fervent heat. Then there appears to be a thousand year leap to the next verse, verse 13, a thousand year leap ahead. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, look forward to these things. Be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. So to hasten the coming of the day of the Lord means to wait with eagerness, patient expectation. With eagerness and patient expectation. Because the Christian doesn't dread the day and the signs in the heavens in the Revelation 6, the uh, sixth seal being opened, like the rest of the world will. We're not to dread that day. If our hearts are right with God, we will look up with joy and know that our redemption is near. Wonderful things. So that was my second point. God will, and Jesus Christ will take care of their flock, or to be not afraid. My third and final point is, today also marks the revealing of the sons of God. Now, Mr. Bruce Rivers covered some of this in his early morning message. Please come back with me to 1 Peter 2 and verse 4. 1 Peter 2 and verse 4. Here the Apostle Peter says that the citizens of God's kingdom are being built into a spiritual house. Which is an analogy that Peter is borrowing from the physical temple in Jerusalem at that time. 1 Peter 2 and verses 4 and 5. Coming to him as to a living stone rejected indeed by men but chosen by God and precious the cornerstone the foundation stone of the temple had a cornerstone and Peter is likening Jesus Christ to that cornerstone by which every other stone of the building is coordinated from you start with that cornerstone and then the rest of the building is erected up in a proper uh, measurements and so He's saying Jesus Christ is the living stone rejected by people but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up. We're one of the stones. Each of us is a stone in this spiritual temple that God is building. And also to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so when the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, we're likened to living stones becoming a home for God to dwell in. John 14, verse 23, Jesus Christ says, we will come to a person that keeps his word and his father will love him and we will come and make our home with him. He tells the disciples that on the last night before his crucifixion. If anyone loves me and keeps my word, we will come and make our home in that person. Let's continue 1 Peter 2. Verses 9 and 10, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, meaning becoming a royal priesthood, from verse 5, 
becoming a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We once were not a people, but now we are the people of God. Once we did not have mercy, but now we have obtained mercy. Verses 11 and 12, Peter adds that while we're being groomed and prepared for that role, he says, beloved, I beg you as sojourners, sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Much of the conduct in our daily lives is going to come back to people's memory at some later date. If we did a kind deed, if we showed mercy, if we showed good cheer at a time when people needed it, it's amazing the things that are going to come back to recollection in people's lives who, who aren't you know, being called in this age, who are not being called in this age. So let's turn to one more passage before I close today. One more passage in Galatians 3 and verse 26. Galatians 3 and verse 26. We're told that we are now the sons of God. It says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. This means we were purchased for a price by Christ's sacrifice. We're no longer slaves to sin. We are slaves to Jesus Christ. We were offered now the full rights as full natural born children in God's family and heirs to the promises of an inheritance. Just like the legal system of the day in the time this was written, we are being given full rights as eternal sons and daughters if we overcome to the day of Jesus Christ. So my third point on the hope of eternal life could be summed up in a passage that Mr. Bruce Rivers covered this morning. Let me just read three verses from it. It's in Romans 8 and verse 19 through 21. Romans 8 verses 19 through 21 says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, that means the birth and the aging and the dying process over and over and over again, turning back into dust again. That's the futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of that corruption, the dead bodies in their graves, listening to the call of Jesus Christ, the first fruits coming up out of their graves first and so forth into the glorious liberty of the children of God. In the final future fulfillment of what this day of trumpets represents, the coming of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords will be witnessed by all nations, all peoples, and a stunning display of signs in the heavens. And yes, most of the earth will be utterly terrified because they'll be caught off guard. It'll be kind of like, well, Jesus Christ says, as lightning flashes from east to west, so shall the Son of Man be. Everyone is going to see it. Nobody is going to be missing out on that event, seeing it. So after the final gathering of nations for war against the coming Christ, and he suddenly puts an end to war for a thousand years, peace as this world has never known will ensue. So this feast day of rejoicing shares that there must continue be, to be a message of warning and hope while doors are still open to preach the gospel. This feast day of rejoicing should bring us comfort that Jesus Christ will care for his flock and provide needs no matter what happens in the world around us. And this feast day of rejoicing marks the revealing of the sons of God, the daughters of God, the hope fulfilled, the hope of glory, and the crown of life given to each who overcomes. So let's be reminded in this feast day to keep vigilance 
of the perilous times we live in. Let's all pray as we remember to thy kingdom come. There's coming a time when God's will is going to be done on this earth as it is in heaven. In the meantime, we're to be not afraid, but we are to rejoice.